Christmas Eve, 1979, the Soviet Union rolled into Afghanistan. Muslims had revolted against the Soviet-friendly regime established the year before. The DRA forces could no longer contain it themselves, so the Soviets went in to intervene. The Afghan government was powerless and fraught with infighting. They lost the hearts and minds of the people, and that alarmed the Soviet leadership. With the Islamic Revolution happening in Iran, the Soviets felt they had to act fast or risk the spread of Islamic revivalism. A superpower sending a motorized rifle division against men on horseback with antique rifles. Everyone thought it'd be over in an instant. Only it wasn't. Some Muslims made their fight a jihad, a holy war, and began a guerrilla campaign on all fronts. A war of attrition. These fighters call themselves Mujahideen. They're being supported by the West through Pakistan. That's why Miller was involved. He was training them near the Zero Line, sponsored by the CIA. The war has become a nightmare for the Soviet troops stationed here. They thought they'd be headed home in six months at the most. Then a year passed. Two years. Now here we are four years on with no exit in sight. Afghanistan has become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. The Soviet troops on the ground want to go home, but at least they have homes to go back to. The Afghans have lost theirs. The Soviets destroy the Kishloks, villages, wherever they can. They burn down homes and fields, fill in wells, turn pastures into minefields. It's created a mass of refugees who fled to Pakistan. If the Mujahideen are fish swimming around the villages, the Soviets will go so far as to dry out their ocean. But this has had a big price. There's bitter resentment among the Afghans, and they're taking out their anger on the soldiers on the front lines. Among the Mujahideen are the Pashtun people. They're fiercely devoted to their code of Badal, or revenge. Soviets they've captured have had their hands, feet, and noses cut off before being left to die at the side of the road, just to show their comrades what they're capable of. Friendlies who come across them can do nothing but put them out of their misery. Then they burn down another village in retaliation, and the cycle of vengeance goes on. This war... The Kremlin never expected to have this much trouble against the Mujahideen. Afghanistan is a tribal society. Tradition demands that its people stand up to any outsiders who set foot on their land. With the honor of their people at stake, they have everything to fight for. No matter how hard the Soviets hit them, they continue to appear out of nowhere, striking back, then vanishing again. But there's one thing even the Mujahideen fear. Every last one of them. The Soviet gunships. They're highly maneuverable and equipped with massive firepower. Plus, the underside of the fuselage is heavily armored. The Mujahideen can barely scratch them with their small arms. Anyone who hangs around gets mowed down by the gunship's heavy machine guns. This new honeybee weapon that was given to the Hamid fighters, it's no doubt something to help them strike back against the gunships, which makes it a weapon that could change the course of the war. Those guerrilla fighters known as Mujahideen don't actually belong to a single organization. Afghanistan is a multi-ethnic country. You've got the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and each of them is split into their own tribes, large and small. Each ethnicity has several rebel organizations that their various tribes gather under. They're united under the banner of Jihad, but that doesn't mean they work like a single standing army. Just look at the area around Smasi Fort. A lot of Tajiks used to live there, but they fled after the Soviets started their scorched earth campaign. With the area uninhabited, the Hamid fighters, who are Pashtun, decided to move in. The Hamids are based out of the city of Peshawar. We passed through it on the western edge of Pakistan. The Pashtun people have long lived in Afghanistan and western Pakistan. They used to travel back and forth frequently. Then Britain went and established the border that still stands today. The Hamid fighters get generous support from the Pakistani government. The government wants to use them to secure influence over Afghanistan. Their liaison with the Hamids is inner services intelligence, and behind the ISI, you have the CIA. 
That's probably how the honeybee ended up in the hands of the Hamid men. I had the R&D team analyze the honeybee. How? The CIA wanted it with everything intact. They took it apart to look at it. Then they put it back together. Everything intact. <laughs> That's the R&D boys, all right. Turns out the honeybee's homing capabilities are a cut above previous manpads. It can detect a broad range of infrared wavelengths, and even ultraviolet for supplementary guidance. Hence the name, huh? Right. Honeybees rely on UV light to fly. With this device, flares don't do the target any good. That's why the Soviets are losing so many gunships. And why the CIA was so desperate to get it back. It wasn't just about preventing the Soviets from devising countermeasures. What if the likes of Iran got their hands on it? American aircraft would be put at risk, too. We can use this tech to develop our own portable missile. That'll give us a huge advantage. It'll take a little time before the analysis results can be applied to actual implementation. But we'll keep moving with the research.